Hey, hey, happy Tuesday, and welcome back to another episode of Pathfinder. Today's guest is Jordan Noon, who at the age of 22, made a crazy decision to start Relativity Space. And I mean, hindsight 2020 looks like it's paying off. Jordan now is co-founder and GP of Embedded Adventures. We'll get into that. We'll get into rebellious streaks. We'll, be get, we'll get into being students and launching rockets and much more. But before we dive in, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Our reliance on satellites for navigation, communications, commerce, and intelligence has grown exponentially in the new space economy. Unfortunately, the risks have grown as well, and the need to prioritize cybersecurity around space assets is critical. Spider Oak Mission Systems provides space cybersecurity products for military, commercial, and civilian operators. Their orbit secure solution is the first to deliver zero trust security to zero gravity environments, protecting space communication, command, control, data transmission, storage, and integrity to data level. To learn more about Orbit Secure, check out their website at spideroak-ms.com. Again, that's spideroak-ms.com. Without further ado, Jordan Noon, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ryan. It's good to see you. I did a baseline of due diligence to know that it was noon and not no one. What percentage would you say get that wrong versus right on the first try? It's probably 50-50, or at least you see some strong hesitancy before they get it right. Okay. Okay. What's the, uh, the etymology? I didn't, I didn't do, unfortunately, I didn't do enough due diligence to know like the background of noon. It, it's actually an Irish last name. Uh, most people, I, I, I wouldn't have guessed that, you know, if, if I had heard it. Okay. Okay. Well, th- mine, mine is obviously Duffy. So we're kindred, kindred spirits in that regards. So enough about our ancestry. Let's get into Jordan Noon. And I want to start with your resume, a quick rundown, and we'll of course go through it in more detail, but let's start at the top of the resume, like the, the uh, education, I suppose. Well, that sounds good. I, I view my career and, and education starting you know, at USC, and my main experience at USC was running USC's Rocket Propulsion Lab. You know, I, I'm not a traditionally, you know, academic student. I don't necessarily thrive, whether it was in, you know, middle school, high school or college in a traditional classroom setting. Like I, I value it as a complement to a, a hands-on education. So when I first met USC's Rocket Propulsion Lab, they came to my introduction to aerospace course. It was AME, you know, 105 at USC. And um, I loved what the group was doing. They were trying to be the first student group to fly a rocket to space. Um, that was their own goal. It wasn't following el- someone else's competition, someone else's goal. And it was very ambitious um, and a little rebellious, too, to be doing that when no one else had uh, kind of set that. Um, so I kind of fell in love with that group. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, a, it was an amazing adventure. Rebellious, yeah. <laughs> it, it tends to follow. I think that'll be a theme. But uh, with that, I ended up... Jordan, oh, yeah. Was that the was that the moment when they when that club came to class that extracurriculars began to take over academics for you or coursework where you you were spending more time there, uh, or did that happen later, or did it happen at all? Absolutely, no. I, I it it started very soon afterwards. I remember. I think it was the first Friday of school, so the first week of my freshman year, and um, that they came to the class. Um, and I remember, you know, they said their first meeting was later that day. It was like Friday at 4 p.m. And, you know, everyone else was going to their first, you know, party of the year. Or maybe not even their first, you know, their 10th party of the year by that point. And for me, um, I went to that group. And what they were doing that semester was working on um, a rocket that was going to fly to Mach 4, like 60,000 feet. It was a subscale prototype to test the thermal protection, kind of simulate the thermal and aero conditions low in the atmosphere that the future space shots would achieve. And it was flying in like 19 days and out of Black Rock Desert, Nevada. And they hadn't even started building it yet. And that was something that was just super fun. And I remember working on that project my second week of school. I had my, uh, I think it was like medieval history GE discussion. Uh, and I actually ended up enjoying the class, but you know the the thing that was funny was I ended up building the nose cone, it was the carbon fiber nose cone for that uh, rocket overnight. You know, laying up the carbon fiber, baking it in an oven, you know, demolding it. And I went to that class. It was an eight a.m. discussion, and I fell asleep during the discussion. It was like a ten person discussion. You know, it's a small group in there, and I get an email from the TA afterwards. Can't blame me for that. <laughs> I did enjoy the class, um, but the TA emailed me and they said, if you're just going to fall asleep, don't come. And for me, I was like, okay, I didn't know that was an option. Thank you. I won't be seeing you again. 
and uh, <laughs> wow, there you go, straight straight to the point. <laughs> it uh, no, that kind of set the foundation of the theme there. But it was something that I I loved certain classes. I tended to love classes that had a level of rigor and what I felt education and value that other people found as being you know somewhat daunting or not worth their time. And they were too difficult, you know, too strenuous. And then the classes that I tended to not put effort in were ones that um, I felt I wasn't going to get anything out of them. You know, and those were classes that other people found the homework to be super easy. They could do it. They get an easy A. And for me, it's an easy A, but that's not worth my time. It was a very different approach than other students were taking. Yeah, understood. I mean, that's a, probably a topic for an entire, entirely separate podcast and publication, but just the educate the education education system and how certain aspects of it might be a little broken in today's world and for you know what today's industry and companies demand. But getting us back on track before I get us way too off track. The the uh I like I want to zero in on the rebellious streak for a second. Did, how was your relationship with the USC administration? Did like did they like what you were doing? Were they proud of you? For fast forwarding to you know the rocket launch, and then of course now of you know, having having being this this industry luminary in a hometown industry of, of rockets. Did you have, did you ever butt heads with like the actual administration, or was it a more was it more smooth? It was always a complicated relationship because they loved what we were doing. But it was something that no university in the world had to tackle, which was a, you know, very fast moving program like that, where the students had significant autonomy to be working on those projects. And that autonomy, I think, was something that I, I craved after leaving college. You know, it's something very few students have that level of liberty, you know, that young to control what they work on. Um, but there were things, especially, you know, my generation that we went um, and the lab went from working on projects that were, I, I would consider kind of standard amateur scale rocketry and where it was reasonable for a student group to be working on those, you know, in a university environment. And then all of a sudden it was hundreds of pounds of propellant at once, things going Mach 7 instead of Mach 2. Right. You know, the infrastructure, the weight of things, the um, the amount of tooling required, it, it turned from very rapidly, you know, a slow buildup of maturing those underlying areas to then all of a sudden all the pieces started fitting together and we were getting prepped to fly these space shots. And that was something that generally outgrew what the administration was ready to handle on a compliance side, on a facility side, on a launch insurance side. And that was a hand in hand relationship, but one that uh, thankfully over the last almost uh, decade since I graduated, decades since that first space shot attempt, then the university and the lab leadership has been very constructive in bringing expectations and, um, and accountability controls to a level where the group can still thrive, but that the university understands the needs and the lab understands the needs of the university kind of hand in hand. Well, I can see in USC's defense, how they don't really, how they wouldn't have really had any mental models or frameworks for how to handle this sort of program, because not that many countries have even done this, right? That's, that's right. Forget, forget schools for a second. It's countries like, yeah, yeah no, very few companies, very few countries, you know, have, have flown, you know, to those, those speeds, those altitudes, those, you know, propellant levels, um, especially as, as students working on that, you know, essentially from scratch. And uh, But the university has been extremely supportive on facilities, on financing. I actually was uh, with the administration just this last Monday then, and we spoke quite a bit on what the future of that group um, has as far as from their perspective and how to make sure that achieves what's best from, you know, my perspective for the student experience. I'm really interested in the topic of clusters of talent density in the space industry. And as it relates to the propulsion lab, would you say that that has kind of become a finishing school for aerospace engineers and rocket jocks who go on to work in the commercial space industry or in your case, you know, start a company? Absolutely. Without that lab existing in the experience I had there, I would not have gotten the internship I did at SpaceX, the internships, I did, the SpaceX internship being right after graduation. Um, I entered at Blue Origin, other companies before then. But the ability to have that hands-on experience in a relevant environment, and you graduate um, years ahead 
of where someone else would be. And I think that accelerated my career as much as, uh, you know, relativity, you know, I started at 22, Tim was 24, 25 at the time. And Tim was in that same group. That's where I met Tim that first week. He uh, was mentoring me, showing me his simulations and, you know, showing how he knew the rocket would go to, you know, 59,000 feet and some MATLAB code. And I remember that being my first time meeting Tim. Um, but for us, we got experience that no one else would have had and the ability to have those lessons learned in an environment where the stakes are you know, high. You're flying a rocket, but you're not flying a commercial mission. You're not flying crew. And you learn so much so quickly that you, um, you, you almost can't be caught up with if you don't do something like that. Well, you know, I myself had a traditional liberal arts background, and I would say I'm pretty non-technical, but... When you're working on stuff like that, I can't fault you for falling asleep at an 8 a.m. medieval <laughs> history uh, discussion. So well, I'm glad you mentioned your, your internships. That's a perfect segue. So mm -hmm. why don't we get towards the end of your college career? And mm -hmm. actually, when you graduated for, I don't know how long, it was probably a few months or a year maybe of, well, I'll let you say it, yeah. but before, and then we'll get to relativity. Yeah, I went to SpaceX immediately after college. I was actually one of the last people in you know my friend group in the lab to figure out where they were going. And then it was something I tended to to wing those sort of things. And um, I ended up getting in at SpaceX. I interned in the in space propulsion group, so the group that designed the propulsion system for um, the Dragon spacecraft. And it does not feel like um, what it was 2014, so eight years ago now. We were working on flight uh, flight seven of Falcon Nine which just seems incredibly long ago in, in flight heritage, but um, for Dragon, especially since there were like seven, <laughs> there were like seven in the past, I don't know, three weeks, yeah. two months. Yeah, no, it was a time where I have like, you know, my mission patches and the, the handful of mission patches for my time there. And that's what people get in like a couple months now. But um, my first project was qualifying the Cargo Dragon propulsion system for flying on the upgraded 1.1 uh, vehicles, Falcon 9 1.1. And the first flight went up with flight six, for 1.1 and then flight seven was the first dragon mission on 1.1 so requalifying the vehicle based on you know as flown vibration loads shock loads you know temperature loads on the upgraded vehicle and then i graduated from my internship i became full-time uh later in 2014 and i spent a year working on the pad abort test vehicle um, for testing the abort system uh, with crew and then i had my first um, from scratch in-house designs for the crew vehicle and that actually flew. And I uh, worked on those designs from scratch, uh, design, manufacturing, uh, initial integration of those. Um, and some survived close resembling my designs by the time the vehicle flew and some, you know, were scrapped then. But I did have designs that made it onto station um, on the previous crew missions over the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, talk about, you know, hands-on experience as an intern and entry-level employee, it, it, you know, if you can do the work, then you can do the work. And before we actually move on, this is a super fun fact. So I'd be remiss to not mention it. I don't know if you, you recognize this. I think I do. Yeah, it is. It's an, it's an FAA license and yeah. I did not have to go through it's for, sure. it's for a drone. Uh, it's what I, what I do in my free time, whenever I have free time, which is not much, but but you 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 can relate to this. Except yours was probably four, five, six orders of magnitude more difficult. Your your license that that you 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 got, but you you were the first student ever to receive an FAA license for launch, right? That that's correct, and that's back in the USC days when we were flying the space shots. the The biggest challenge uh, my first year leading the group was getting the licenses. It, it was something that. Uh, you know, when you call up the FAA and you say, hey, we're a bunch of students, we want to fly a rocket at Mach 7 in the middle of the country to um, to space, you know, 300,000 plus feet, like past the, the Von Karman line. Um, th they'll engage with you and then they, they tend to, at least at the time, it, it withered, right? Where you're getting not only the FAA, but the Bureau of Land Management who controls the land where the group used to fly from in Black Rock Desert. Getting them to agree on even basic things like jurisdiction, Right. When does it go from BLM authority to FAA authority? Is it at ignition? Is it at takeoff? Is it at landing? Like, what if there's an anomaly? Those sorts of questions. There's um, endangered birds in Black Rock Desert, the sage grouse. And there was a question of what if part of the um, 
the you know three sigma you know three standard deviation dispersion for where these land what if that lands on a bird and, and that was a question we legitimately had to work around was designing the trajectories and the dispersions to be optimized around not landing on um the sage grouse territory in um in black rock desert and then once we worked through that it, it did take um, for my generation, like my time there, over a year from me taking over the lab in 2012 to getting a license. And a lot of that involved building tools like from scratch simulation of these rocket trajectories, you know, six degree of freedom simulation tools that barely anyone in the industry had had to develop from scratch. And even the previous lab leadership, when I started going down the route of the lab developing our own simulation trajectory software so that we could satisfy FA requirements that previous softwares were not ideal for, for delivering with. And um, they told me that we were not qualified as a, as a group. Like the previous lab leadership told me we weren't qualified as a group to recreate these tools from scratch. And now the lab builds off those and that's at the foundation for not only USC's group, but other groups within the country. And for what a student group doing an FAA license at that caliper would, would look like. But we set that foundation back in 2012, 2013. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure it was some consolation knowing that those like long nights building that simulation software, that it wasn't just for this one off launch and that you would be able to leverage that down the road along with, with countless others who followed in your footsteps. The other thing I would point out is I doubt that you had a, an army of lawyers in tow helping you with all this. We, we eventually built allies within the USC administration that have championed that group. Um, but when it came to things like launch insurance, you know, FAA negotiations, we were generally on our own for a long time as far as what fit university requirements, what fit the um, FAA requirements, Bureau of Land Management requirements. And, you know, this was a time where, you know, it, it sounds odd to talk about now, but the level of even infrastructure available in Black Rock Desert at the time was very small. You know, it's an empty lake bed. And when Burning Man happens there, it's full of activity. But even if you look back in 2013, when we flew our first space shot out of there, there were no cell towers. So, you know, you look back at the what's called the 7711-2, which was the actual FAA license waiver. Um, we were on sat phones in the middle of the desert. Then, you know, uh, we had sat satellite internet and 2013 satellite internet in Nevada was not something, you know, to praise. And when we're on a, you know, an, an Iridium, you know, uh, uh, you know, cell tower or cell, uh, you know, a sat phone and trying to get weather reports so that we could understand, you know, flight windows and then the actual flight uh, kind of launch sequence, you know, you call three different air traffic control zones, you call Sacramento and you ask them to move, move the traffic and you call Reno and ask them to move the traffic. And then you move, call Seattle, like, Hey, move the traffic. And then you call NORAD. So, so imagine you call the bunker. Yeah. Yeah. You, you call NORAD as your final step and you're like, you know, and, and this is me as a, you know, this is what 2013. So I was uh, 19 or 20 at the time. And I, I have to remember when exactly in the year it was. And um, you're on the phone in the middle of the desert on a sat phone calling NORAD saying, hey, if you see something going up at Mach 7 over, you know, uh, CODIS, uh, hopefully in Nevada, then that uh, it's us. Like, don't send the fighters. Yeah. <laughs> and that was an interesting entry point there as far as the amount of exposure on the logistics, the government affairs, the simulation. Um, I can't think of another opportunity that would have had any resemblance to that level of of education and opportunity, especially that young. Yeah. Well, we're on the topic of ridiculously audacious things that you probably had no business doing. Let's talk about starting relativity at the age of 22. And relativity, I should mention, needs no introduction because we talked with your co-founder in last week's episode. But we will, of course, talk about some parts of the stack and the actual technology as you as you were CTO, but I'm getting ahead of you. So turn it over to you. Yeah, relativity and starting at 22, and, and same for Tim, you know, he's a little bit older than me. Um, we had never taken a business class, a finance class, a legal class, you know, we're two young engineers. And we, we were decently experienced for our age, but we both had had exposure to 3D printing, right? Myself at SpaceX with the Super Draco engines on the Dragon spacecraft and a couple other components on the vehicles on, on Falcon that were um, becoming printed at the time. It was not at all a predominant technology within the company. And, and same at SpaceX for what Tim was working on for their crew capsule. And But me and Tim had stayed in touch, and it's the happen chance of how this stuff comes together is um, 
we ended up talking just, you know, uh, driving home after work, you know, we'd call each other. And then it was my entry into driving around through LA traffic, getting out of Hawthorne, then in the middle of the day, and where um, I learned the joys of calling people while driving. And the main thing that really resonated between us was that this 3D printing, and it's still the case today in various ways, like I can expand on that later, then was viewed in a way that we disagreed with, right? It was being viewed as this one-off, almost novelty, or this one-off, you know, very powerful technology for combustion chambers. But people weren't seeing the value at like a more company-wide side of it as far as what would happen if you transform the whole manufacturing floor. And that insight that no one else was going to do this, still no one else is, is working on anything approaching it. And I think it's clear that the majority of the industry still does not actually understand the benefits that relativity has. Then if you look at the critiques and commentary. Um, but we saw something was there and we did what I think any good engineer does. And we Googled, uh, you know, how to get venture capital. And the two names were Mark Cuban and Y Combinator that came up and, you know, we pinged Mark and that story is pretty public and famous now. And, and, uh, we applied to Y Combinator. I'll put a link in the show notes, but mm -hmm. yeah, a cold email to Mark Cuban. It's a good story. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and we got our initial financing and, uh, that was after me and Tim had left uh, our previous jobs. We kind of knew we were onto something and got financing and then, uh, the rest is history at this point. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like going through Y Combinator? And I asked Tim the same question, but. There, were, there weren't many space companies that had come before you. We had a really strong batch of aerospace companies. It was us, um, Astranis, uh, and maybe not space, but aerospace with a uh, boom, supersonic, all, all in the same batch. And and I think YC was a definitely a, um, a strong inflection point at trying to support and find really strong hardware companies and founders. And, and I think as YC has scaled, um, some of the challenge has been supporting those hardware companies that need very different advice, very different support as they have rapidly expanded the rest of their program. But I found it to be extremely valuable on educating us on fundraising, on investor messaging, on even investor connections and introductions through Demo Day in a way the company would be dramatically different if we did not go through Y Combinator. Um, but it's something our experience, you know, seven years ago now is even very different than the experience that founders get today through Y Combinator. Right, right. And I mean, I should mention your, uh, sorry, Relativity's cap table, you know, the social capital playground, obviously Y Combinator, Bond Capital, like mm -hmm. those, those are some big names. And I'm sure for many of them. It's an, it's an impressive list. Yeah, I'm sure for many of them, they didn't really have much experience investing in aerospace. But we could actually save that for later on in the conversation when we get to venture. Before before moving on from 3D printing, are, are there any parts of the rocket? And of course, this is looking back a few years maybe now. But are, are there any parts of the rocket that aren't, in your view, better 3D printed or, or with today's technology and the relativity's bespoke printers that like can't adequately be 3D printed or flight proven, that sort of thing, like like a, yeah. a fuel tank. I mean, sure. yeah, I, I don't know. You're, you're the expert, not me. Yeah. Well, and this gets a little bit as far as how we view the 3D printing and, and me and Tim viewed it when we started the company. And it gets a little bit out of, to, to kind of expand the scope of your question, when you look at 3D printing part by part, there's definitely trade-offs. Then we're, if you look, you know, on the cost benefit analysis of, you know, a, a very, let's say, you know, simple part that could otherwise be stamped sheet metal and, and you want to print it, right? You know, there's benefits and, and there's detriments to it. It's maybe more expensive. It's maybe doesn't make sense to support. There's maybe no performance advantage. Right. Like the ideal example is something like a combustion chamber where you can get, you know, internal features, flow channels that you otherwise couldn't get. You know, the, the combustion chamber tends to be the ideal example. And almost every company in the world now doing rocketry has a 3D printed combustion chamber. It's very rare um, to not see a 3D printed combustion chamber. But it's that part by part conversation where we saw other people being really blind because we tried to view it from a whole a holistic company level of, you know, one part- First principles. Yeah, one part may make sense to do a sheet metal if you just look at it as a part, but now you have to support a supply chain for sheet metal. You have to support a manufacturing floor for, for sheet metal. You have to support inspection, design, right? All of the steps that go in there. 
and you have this one-off part that's maybe now from a very limited lens better, you know, better at, you know, being a rocket part, however you want to quantify it. But the company's performing worse. The company can't move as quickly. The company's working with fixed tooling that can't change or be digitized easily. And that's something that can be really um, conflated by many people who look at the company, where they have the questions as far as how, how will 3D printing ever be better than rolling sheet metal at forming a tank? And there's some pretty high level comments there that are easy to, to look at as far as, you know, you look inside any rocket, you look at the cross section of a Falcon 9. There's plenty of photos of, you know, Falcon 9s being worked on with their tanks open. And um, there's thousands of internal pieces of stiffening in there. Right. You know, stiffening structures, some have isogrid, but a rocket is never just a shell. Right. There's a huge amount going on in there. And that's one part that is is easily forgotten by people who just say, you know, it, why not just form sheet metal? And because it's not just sheet metal. And then, you know, the second you know point I'd add is what I was hinting at earlier is if you focus on just one manufacturing process and that manufacturing process does not have tooling constraints that are significant tooling constraints, you can move much quicker. It's a digitally native process. And so learning from the manufacturing, automating it, um, having insights, changing designs, that's all, all enabled by the 3D printing in a way that isn't analyzing any one specific part's applicability. So a part could be worse you know, from some metrics being 3D printed, but it actually could be a better, higher performing company and system if you 3D print it. But some people, some people will never understand that. Yeah. So the digitalization and automation components are interesting. And I do think we'll return to that later on in the conversation with the, uh, the, the, the cat inspired, uh, company, but I, I said this on the last podcast, but in a way, you know, part of the model, it seems it is, is one that the factory is the product. And then there are a confluence of more macro trends that would seemingly be pretty favorable for relativity's model. And that's, you know, messed up supply chains and just the vast disparate web that I think folks are paying a lot more attention to. I haven't talked about it too extensively on the podcast, but we have, we spill plenty of ink in the, in the newsletter about it, but just, you know, the disparate web of the industrial base and like all the machining shops and everything. So it does, I can see, at a high level, how that would work in your, how the approach would work in your favor now, just given the way certain things with the world are going. I mean, we, yeah, we, we, we could, we could keep going there, but let's, so your transition out of relativity, as I understand it, you know, you just wanted to get back into something earlier stage. Right. And I, I can relate to that because that's actually why I left my last company. But in your yeah, in your own words, I, I want to set the scene for what sure. you're working on now. Yeah. Back in 2020, and it was a conversation with Tim for uh, I'm trying to remember. It, it was definitely more than multiple years ahead of my transition in 2020. As far as the company starting to graduate from the initial foundation building, which is where I, I really thrived. I, I loved it, you know, developing the first printers, building the thesis around why the printers even make sense. You know, the foundation for what it would look like to change a rocket from a traditional design to a 3D printable design. You know, the rocket changes significantly in some ways that are higher performing, in some ways that are short term sacrifices. Right. It's definitely some very interesting trade offs there in order to get a rocket to be fully 3D printable. And that's something that that foundation started to really solidify, you know, 2018, 2019, where we went from one functioning printer to a dozen functioning printers. And, and the core tech had been proven out. You know, we were testing rockets. We were testing fully 3D printed structures. We were putting thrust loads through 3D printed tanks under cryopropellant temperatures. And, um, and the rest of the issues, you know, I, I don't want to sound like I downplay the rest of the challenges that a rocket company faces. But a lot of them to me and where I really wanted to spend my time felt not only that there were other people in the world that had already solved those issues. A lot of them, you know, you go from one rocket company to another and you have a similar style of challenges. Some are pretty unique and nuanced, but the majority of them start becoming previously solved problems. And that's where we expanded the leadership team. We expanded a significant amount into people that had built factories, built rocket programs before. 
and but developed a foundation that the tech was ready. You know, the 3D printing tech was ready and uh, had the leadership bench built out in a way where they could handle any of the kind of previously solved and known problems that were coming up. And, um, and for me, I was very hungry to go back to an earlier stage. You know, there's people very good at expanding a company from, you know, 200 to 800 people in a year. And I'm not necessarily the best at that. And I don't need to be the best at that, right? Because I thrive at a scale where I could, you know, add value in lots of different ways to the world that wasn't, um, you know, scaling a company, you know, 4X year over year when there's people that have done that and are good at it. To paraphrase, I don't know, maybe like the skill set and your inclination, like what you, you're more more so wanting to go zero to one, not going like increments right. beyond one. And we had we had kind of achieved that on the relativity side by that. Yeah, point. yeah. It's time for a short break to hear from our sponsors again. Space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. Spider Oak Mission Systems builds space cybersecurity solutions for civilian, military, and commercial space operations. Their orbit secure protocol delivers zero trust security to zero gravity environments protecting space communication, command, control, data transition, storage, and integrity at the data level. To learn more about how Zero Trust architectures will revolutionize security in new space, download the new NSR Spider Oak sponsored white paper titled Space Cybersecurity, Current, State, and Future Needs. Find the white paper at spacecyber.com. Again, that's spacecyber.com. Quite the domain you got there. Or check out their website at spideroak-ms.com and tell them Pathfinder sent you. So I've already kind of previewed it, but talked, you know, I've alluded to venture a couple of times, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about what came next and how embedded ventures came to be? Yeah. My, the embedded ventures chapter was not one that I had previously planned. And it was something that I didn't know what I wanted to do next. There was a little bit of soul searching to do. And one of the people that had reached out to me is my, you know, Embedded Ventures co-founder, you know, Jenna Bryant. And she, I had known from the LA uh, venture capital ecosystem. She was a partner at another fund here in Los Angeles. And she had uh, pinged me uh, a year or two earlier. Um, and I started to get to know her as part of an event series, bringing together uh, venture capital backed founders who had success working with the US government. And Relativity has been a shining example of US government affairs as a fast moving startup. Um, no scorched earth. It's definitely been a collaborative hand in hand relationship, which is very unlike, you know, some other startups in the industry and, and outside of the industry. Um, and bringing them together with DOD innovation leaders in a closed door setting where we could talk about what the future of venture capital DOD collaboration looked like and how to get more founders involved in the national security ecosystem, then more venture capital funds involved in the national security ecosystem. And that was something that for her, there was a personal tie. Her brother is a V-22 Osprey pilot. You know, he's on the USS America in the South China Sea right now. And, and she wanted to make sure he had access to the same technology she saw consumer startups having access to here in the States. But she was seeing so much hesitancy, so much uh, inertia against working with the national security community as a venture fund or a venture backed company that she wanted to see something else there. So that's where her and I met in the, in this instance of the Osprey, V-22 Osprey, an example of that might be like in-cabin connectivity or cockpit connectivity. Absolutely. And that was a prime example where she was seeing companies uh, that were delivering solutions, you know, some of which were, were in her portfolio, you know, delivering solutions on network connectivity to bring real-time gaming through dynamic network rerouting from the Middle East to the Americas. Then something that was extremely advanced technology, then very lucrative on the commercial capitalization, but also something very valuable when it comes to real-time latency for um, defense communications, you know, real-time traffic rerouting if there's a compromised node as an intermediary, you know, that you can do very valuable things if you have control of dynamic network rerouting based on specific packet information and, and dynamic conditions then worldwide. And that was something that she very much saw a need for, but saw companies where their first contract, you know, their first investor was controlled by a hostile foreign government. And what do you do? Do these startups even know what they're getting into? And that's where she really led the conversation and her and I got to know each other for a, a number of years pre-embedded was, you know, what leads so many founders to bringing in conflicted investors? You know, why are there so many people that try to get into the defense ecosystem and then they view it too hard because they accidentally have their cap table full of very conflicted capital? 
And, and they don't even realize it. You know, how do we get ahead of this? And how did, you know, specifically the original question she had for me was how did relativity get ahead of that? Yeah. Just in terms of being, you know, skating to where the the puck is, is going rather than where it is, like y'all were thinking about Scythius. And I was actually in my, in a past life, writing about it quite a bit before I think a lot of people, I mean, it's still a relatively obscure term, but it is a very, very important and increasingly influential uh, inter intergovernment uh, U.S. national security panel that essentially reviews deals and and cap tables and whatnot. And we've you know we've seen we've seen that play out and what happens when when Scythius has concerns. We've seen that play out pretty recently in the aerospace world, but I think that this whole conversation is pretty interesting because it, it has taken on a lot more urgency and relevancy, I would say in the past two years, 18 months, one year, but also just in the past, you know, six months to 12 months, I've heard you use the term clean capital before. Can you define that for listeners or unpack it a bit? Yeah. As far as clean, a clean versus conflicted, Right. And the area that I'd highlight the most in it is that capital can be used um, either intentionally or accidentally, you know, as a weapon. And I'd say often more and highlighted more the intentional side of it. So if you look at, uh, let's say, national security or even hardware investing in the U.S., that's a, a super small minority, especially in venture capital. Right. You, you look at uh, consumer funds, SaaS funds, you know, these areas that if, you know, on a national security side, there's zero relevance to national security innovation. And that's almost intentional, right? There's such a consumer focus here in the States and in the investor base, because it's easier to understand shorter returns, you know, more stable, consistent returns are easier to understand on predicting those. And um, the, venture scalable. Yeah, you, you see an over overly strong focus there and, and they get hyped up, you know, to, to the nth degree as you see those companies grow and the venture capital funds behind them. And that's left a big void in that void in the same way that you, you know, there's a, a continued conversation on, you know, foreign influence in social media, right? You know, foreign political influence in social media. Is social media the only spot that's being influenced or, or are we that naive to think that that's the only spot that there's, there's infiltration? And I'd say that's a very naive angle and being highlighted more and more. And the area as far as, you know, clean versus conflicted is some of these venture capital funds. Sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes you can do some digging and sometimes it's very hard to find, you know, whose money are they deploying? It, the founders are generally blind to that. Often some of the partners at the funds are blind into whose money is actually being deployed. These are blind funds. You don't know who's on the other side of an investment. You know, the VC fund, you see the public side of it. You don't know whose money it is. And often that has ties, whether it's um, foreign governments, you know, whether it's entities working on behalf of foreign governments that want to make sure that as there's a consumer um, focus in the U.S., who's going to capture the hardware companies? Who's going to capture the national security company investment early on before the founders know better, before they're on CFIUS's radar? You know, CFIUS isn't paying attention to two-person companies. And also, it's so hard to dig through, you know, there's SEC forms they file, these funds file if they have foreign influence. They may forget a check mark here or there, and no one catches that for 20 years, right? And now all of a sudden, and again, to your question on clean versus conflicted capital, there's venture capital funds all over the ecosystem biased towards the hardware and national security companies because no one else is investing in those. You know, the major venture capital funds will barely touch them. And that everyone has, you know, certain amounts of IP leakage, control leakage, you know, unclear on, on who's controlling these, who's getting the information. The founders perhaps accidentally did it. It's, it's generally not the founder's fault. You know, they, they often accepted the capital that would lean into them. You know, you hear venture capital funds say it's time to build and then they won't touch a hardware company for years, right? You know, what, what happened there? And that's something that's very confusing, but it's something that that, uh, again, to answer succinctly your question and, and summarize it, the conflicted or, you know, clean versus conflicted capital is that capital that's working on behalf of uh, state actors, essentially. Right. I think, you know, I would venture that this isn't totally terra incognita, totally unfamiliar for aerospace, at least in the traditional or legacy sense. 
just given ITAR and all the sensitivities of these being, you know, th th this being IP and like that, that the U.S. has a national security interest in protecting. I do think, though, with the influx of new commercial players and just the increased velocity of company creation, I could see how some newcomers might not be as familiar with this and might make these missteps and pay the price down the road. And I mean, I would add just there are, for anyone who, who cares to look, there are plenty of case studies out there in, in which some entity, whether it's the U S government, FBI, DOJ, but also, you know, cybersecurity firms explain like step-by-step step how some sort of, and, and, you know, cap table uh, financing is, is but one vector in accessing IP or, or influencing that sort of thing. But there's plenty of examples out there. I mean, just the other week, Christopher Ray, the FBI director was like talking about how the, just the amount of like attacks, I, I forget exactly what word he used, but just, you know, the PRC, it's just like so brazen. Um, but yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. So we could continue on this for hours, but I, I want to return to embedded. It's, it's seed stage, right? Do you take a generalist approach in that you are looking for these types of dual use companies in the hard tech, deep tech, frontier tech, whatever you emerging tech, whatever you want to call it, or, or is it more specialist? The, the direction that Jen and I went, and it's something that, you know, really congealed when I came on full time as a co-founder and in, in GP for Embedded. I, I started as an advisor, you know, kind of post relativity. I was... Um, Kind of, you know, searching for what to do. And she, uh, and I think it was tapping into her original recruiting skills. She's a recruiter pre, you know, before entering venture capital. Then that uh, she asked if I wanted to be an advisor to help build a strategy and kind of the, the back office for what, uh, you know, was becoming embedded. And I said, sure, sounds like a great way to, to you know, take a vacation as a VC uh, while I figure out what I want to do next. And that um, slowly started turning into, uh, you know, kind of the, the foundation that I came from was the venture capital fund that I would have wanted to work with. What would I would have wanted to be mentored on as a 22 year old, guided on, um, help think through on a strategy side. And then where there was a hole in the venture capital market, you know, with Relativity, it was not an easy company to fundraise for. It was not an easy company to explain the thesis to people that had never looked at space companies before, but we won them over. We won them over through a lot of, of effort and strategy. And that's something that, you know, we, we saw how almost misrepresentative the majority of the venture capital market was, you know, that they'll have an opinion on everything on Twitter and you show them a company that's one of a kind and they'd say, oh, that doesn't match our, our pattern matching. We don't have a comparable unicorn to compare that to. And it's like, isn't that your job it is to look for things that don't match, you know, kind of general, like generic patterns. And they would have no interest in leaning in, whether it was the space side, the hardware side, you know, the national security side, zero interest. And when you did have interest, it was often someone like that was a postdoc or PhD that had never built a company before, never implemented something that was functional, like maybe had done some academic research. And but there's a very strong difference, you know, between the two of those that was getting, you know, very conflated. And that's something that, you know, we witnessed firsthand was the difference between you know, the diligence quality, the questions being asked and what we thought was actually valuable to decipher through what would have been good deals out on the market. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as the famous saying goes, hardware is hard, but to, this is probably the best moderation I've ever done in my life, but to loop in the day, <laughs> today's international moon day and to tie it back to hardware is hard. I would just invoke the JFK quote. We go, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard right. and because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept. Yeah. Right. I, I don't know it by memory. I was quote. just reading it off of Google, <laughs> but it, it's a great quote. It's a great quote. Yeah. And I mean, it ties together a lot of these threads. Did the experience that you had raising at Relativity help you? on the other side of the table, so to speak, in the boardroom as a first time fund manager? Absolutely, it shaped a lot. I mean, first off, it was my entire adult life was was growing relativity, you know, at that point that we started embedded. 
then. Um, so it's what I knew, but it was something that had shaped a lot as far as the venture capital ecosystem, you know, what people were willing to lean into and learn. Where was there alignment for me and Jenna and the rest of the team that we built up to have our own niche, right? Find deals that other people would not recognize, would not dig into. Like I get excited when we do a deal and the sense I get, you know, is that some of the market will not perhaps even ever, similar to relativity, where they won't ever understand why it makes sense as a company, right? It's just beyond what their kind of scope to understand. Then in some of the companies we invest in today, you know, we have seven portfolio companies right now. We have a growing portfolio this year that's that's not fully announced. And um, but some of the deals we do, I hope that the venture capital ecosystem doesn't find why they're obvious. You know, they don't find them obvious because if they do, everyone would be doing the deals. There's not something unique that we're seeing. And that's something that shaped my perspective a lot was seeing under the hood of the venture capital ecosystem and under the hood of the Twitter personas that drive that perspective that these VCs are world experts at every topic. Yeah, time for a threat. Yeah, it, yeah it's time for a threat. Um, it's uh, it's a very different different reality. So shaping that as far as what I would have wanted supporting me then, but also being very slow and patient. You know, we started embedded at the peak of capital deployments. And then the absolute peak of capital deployments between, you know, end of 2020 and then through 2021, an absolutely crazy time on an equity deployment side. And I almost felt at times um, out of date, you know, because my early stage fundraising experience was seven years old at that point. It was mid 2015, a market for relativity that was, you know, a launch market that was pretty saturated. You know, SpaceX was thriving. Virgin Orbit had just spun out. You know, Rocket Lab was getting off the ground in a successful manner. You know, Firefly was, was, you know, through some trials and tribulations growing. And, but that was something that was there room for these new entrants that had no experience with this crazy thesis and this extremely capital intensive growth plan that includes building the world's largest metal 3D printers, right? There wasn't room in the market for that. And we created that through the conviction of making it clear how differentiated and different our approach was. But that was something that our fundraising experience was very difficult, especially in the early days. So going into seeing fundraising of early stage companies in 2020, late 2020, early 2021, we had founders that uh, we would ask diligence questions to. And they were like, oh, our other investors told us not to talk to anyone that has diligence questions, just to take checks from people that um, are writing essentially blind. And, and my response internally was like, we had to, we used to have to fly places to have these conversations, you know, and, and you're, you're saying no... Da yeah. You must da no via an email to a phone call. Damn, you, you must you must have been you must have been a little bit jealous though of the uh, of founders in that frothy frothy environment eighteen months ago, where like this you know no no product pitch deck twenty million dollar. There was a moment, that, and it was a long moment. You know, it's hard to exactly capture how long it was, but there was a long period where I did feel out of date. I, I did feel that even my my patience, my ability to diligence was no longer relevant in the fundraising environment. And then we were missing out on deals. There were founders filling up their cap tables with these never heard of investors before that are like leaning into the space industry because it's this hot new thing, um, but don't understand anything about it. That's when you know the Fed need, needs to raise rates. <laughs> And um, I think what ended up happening is we ended up getting into a couple, you know, deals that we spent a lot of time on, you know, that we spent a lot of time with the founders, the teams, understanding the company and verifying that we saw something there that no one else, sometimes even the founders didn't even fully understand what they were getting at, which led to some very, you know, at times underpriced deals, very good multiples that have inked to date on follow on investment. And as those companies have matured and the rest of the market has really faltered. And that patience has paid off. You know, we, we didn't rush investing because the market was rushing. And we're not tanking right now in conservative because the market's tanking. You know, we slowly find good deals. You know, we invest in them. Deals where we can add value, you know, help those multiples grow. And that the rest of the market doesn't recognize. And I sometimes ask the question of, does that mean that we're, because the venture model is so different. A little bit of spray and pray, a little bit of what you hear is the, uh, the power law and just trying to help guarantee you land in that power law distribution. And that's just a slightly gamified rolling of the dice, right? There, there's it, there's not a lot that goes into that on what we are good at and what we can grow these companies through. And I think that means, you know, at times I, I question, should my venture title be removed and it just be called investor and not venture investor? But it's the same ecosystem and we each just have our different strategies and they're playing out, you know, day by day, especially during the current market. 
Yeah. So two questions on that. And then I want to talk about kitty cat a bit. One, are you seeing that you have a little bit more pricing power in this environment? And then two, are you seeing the turbulence headwinds drawdowns in the public markets starting to trickle down? I know that you're on the earlier stage, a uh, much earlier stage of things. So you're not going to be, you know, marking anything down like the crossover funds are, are having to do like every other day now, but there's a slow propagation. I don't think that propagation is fully complete yet as far as how impactful, because it goes from one quarterly report to the next funds, next quarterly report. You know, it's a pretty slow propagation and you see some people trying to recoup that pretty aggressively, you know, as they see, you know, a majority of their portfolio collapse. And um, for us, we haven't felt that, you know, directly in the sense that our portfolio is strong. I think our patience and diligence, you know, in our portfolio companies to date has paid off. And as far as none of them, none of them have gone to zero. You know, some of them are raising at multiple. Some of them are raising at flat rounds. Some of them are doing pretty aggressively large rounds right now for a variety of capital deployment reasons, because it's a certain, you know, from certain circumstances, it's a really good time to be spending, right? Depending on what else is in the market and how they can use that capital. And, but it's something that um, for everyone in the market, you know, no one's felt nothing. You know, for us, it's very much we see, you know, follow on investors, co-investors, everyone's hesitant and perhaps rightfully so, because no one knows how to price late stage. No one knows how to price mid or you know, mid stage, early stage because of that. So there's a lot of hesitancy there. And some of the market leaders, you know, you'll see a letter, a memo from, you know, industry leaders in the venture ecosystem that it says kind of the opposite of the time to build, you know, letter that went out. And they're like, it's time to do consumer for a couple of years. And, and kind of retract into things where you can rely on, you know, revenue multiples, you can re not rely on kind of basic fundamentals, which part of the industry has steered towards that, where they're going back into safe areas, part of it's waiting it out, and part of it's healthily deploying. And I think it's the people that were not affected by the, the oddness of 2020 and 2021 are the same people that are deploying now because they're going to deploy in good companies that are going to be good, whether it's a good market or bad market. They're not relying on on external signal. They're not relying on, you know, macroeconomics to say if this company is good or not. You know, the company is good, whether it's a good economy or not. And that's something that I think is um, going to going to prove itself out. It, it'll take a while for a lot of that to propagate. Understood. As mentioned, one of your portfolio companies that you also have a leadership position at, if I'm not mis mistaken, tell us a little bit about Kitty Cat. Kitty Cat's an interesting company in the sense that we um, we with embedded, you know, we didn't plan to be, you know, an incubator or a venture studio. We don't, you know, refer to ourselves as that as that now. But our thesis as a whole is space technology beyond launch with a dual use tech focus. And, and we split that into three areas. Uh, a third uh, space operations, which is kind of the usual suspects of things happening in space. Then a third is advanced manufacturing. We just find that as a very supplemental area, very much an enabler of very complex hardware projects, so kind of necessary. And also a bit of a hedge because it has massive terrestrial application, kind of obviously applicable in the terrestrial world as well to other industries. And then the third area, um, and this hits very close to home for me as far as my personal passions, is on digital engineering, so software tools for hardware designers. And that's an ecosystem where, you know, you look at the major players today, the major software tools, you know, the big enterprise companies, uh, there hasn't been a lot of change there. There hasn't been a lot of innovation. And that can be surprisingly limiting for hardware companies where you're making the world's most advanced hardware project with the world's most complex materials, with the most advanced manufacturing processes, and you're using a software from the 1970s to design it. Right. And that's something that. Yeah. Or pen and paper or pen and paper or all of these disparate tools where you have, you know, Excel spreadsheets tied to Jira and Confluence notes and all of these enterprise tools that end up being very disparate, very high friction, very error prone because the amount of manual operation between all of them and basically no modern digitization. Obviously, they're all in the computer, but there's nothing that resembles the current software ecosystem and, and the advantages of that. So that's something that for us in the way that we viewed it was there had to be a part of our portfolio that was focused on the digital engineering side. And uh, the challenge is, though, is that there's very few people working on it. It's not an exciting sector. It's not the, you know, the visibleness of manufacturing or launching a satellite or making a rocket. 
And we got rather disappointed as we tried to flush out that part of the portfolio in uh, 2020. We tried to find a company to invest in. We had our thesis on what market winners would look like. Then and tried to find something resembling those. And uh, we found nothing. Unfortunately, we found basically no one in that ecosystem that was doing anything we found uh, likely to succeed, um, likely to be adopted. Um, so we decided to put out a call to action. Uh, we did it on GitHub, trying to get one of the open source projects in that um, community to be matured into an enterprise product. And we got so much inbound from people saying, you know, you guys are the perfect team. Why don't you build this? You have the perfect vision for what this would look like. And you're the only people we have confidence that would build a solution here that would get adopted and be useful. Um, so kind of long story long, we decided to start what being was named uh, KittyCAD and as um, a next generation um, kind of toolkit enabler in the hardware ecosystem. So are you all cat people? Um, I think the majority of people have dogs. I don't know if anyone has a cat. Um, I think it was, uh, it was actually Jenna's grandmother accidentally named that's great kitty cat. Um, she was talking about a kitty cat and she had a very, um, kind of biased, uh, uh pronunciation towards the end towards cat when she said it. And I, I think it just clicked where at first it was a joke, almost like a code name. And then it became this, uh, we made a logo and it became this brand, um, for us that I think, uh, you know, part of it too, is that it's a very friendly brand. Right, it's this very friendly cat that's the the face of the company, and that's something that so many other players in the software for hardware design ecosystem, kind of that toolkit ecosystem, there are companies that have built a lot of betrayal with their customer base. You know, the majority of their, uh, if you could call it innovation, in the last twenty years, has been unbundling and rebundling features in a way that just increases the license count that their customers are paying. You used to be able to do everything in one GUI. And now you need two, and now you need three. And instead of one license, you're buying two, and then you're buying three. So you're paying triple the amount for what is now a higher friction ecosystem. Rack up the seats. And that betrayal is something that um, is not unknown to us when we look at it. And we ha us ha having a very, for developers, by developers, like we are the end user. And, you know, we have fun on our website. We have a very fun brand. Um, we have a very fun logo. Um, that That's that's for sure part of it. I'll link to it. I mean, I I like, I think like front ends are very valuable. I think that some space companies, their launch ones in particular, you know, the usual suspects have great brands, have great websites, but a lot don't. And of course, you know, their, their end user is not like, you know, uh, the average person or consumer, but I still think that it's it's worth the investment. And also as a sucker for alliteration, I, but a dog person, I can appreciate kitty cat and how that sounds better than dog cab, but you might have considered cow cad. I have to give, have to give a, a at some point, well, for, for anyone, for anyone who's, for anyone who's, who's listening and not watching, I have a, a cow, a cow print in the back behind me. So. Oh. I have the I have the Kitty Cat plush doll with me. I have it. Oh, you buy them on the Kitty Cat awesome. store. Um, but no, even on the the Kitty Cat website, you know the the homepage is a very interactive three D. It's a three D dance floor where the Kitty Cat is you know doing various things. And but it's something where you open that and it's you know it, it's not you know our intended messaging with it per se, but it's a set of technologies that people have not seen in the hardware design world. You know interactive you know, real-time graphics that are generating certain things on demand based on what the customer's doing on the dance floor, then um, no one's ever seen something like that in the hardware world uh, of what does modern compute and modern, you know, graphics um, compute implementation look like when applied in to hardware. And um, no, no one has done anything like that. And that's something that uh, we want customers to notice, you know, in a very subtle way, you know, we don't put it in their face. Then, but they're like, this is a set of technologies that has not been integrated together by one of these companies before. Yeah. Well, you did my job for me in a way when you mentioned uh, someone's grandma, because one of the questions that I'm trying to get in the mix at the end of the show here is how would you explain to someone's grandma what you do? And I think that, that is, it's a difficult question for your line of business. So I will let you choose between relativity, kitty cat Im embedded, you know, and this, this basically, you know, the, the purpose of this question is you have to abstract 
away almost all of the complexity. Another way of putting it is like explain right. it like I'm five. That's no, it's a great question. Um, it's one that, and I don't know if Tim had inspired this from last week's conversation, but he always used that as our internal reference at relativity for um, what, yeah, I think it must be a coincidence as far as if you can explain it to your grandmother, um, a venture capitalist can get it. And I view that as a kind of an amusing bar in my mind if I, I zoom out a little bit as far as where the, the bar is on venture understanding. <laughs> That's great. Or your, your, your average venture capitalist can understand it if your grandmother can. Um, and don't think about that too hard um, is, uh, is my advice there. But, but no, um, let's see. Uh, you're you're going to catch me live on trying to do this. For, for KittyCat, it's, it's um, software that people can build hardware design tools with. And I don't, maybe that's not five or grandmother, but it's, it's hopefully close. And, and uh, the example I'd use to zoom out from the, the explain like I'm five references, um, you know, it's similar to Stripe. Like people have heard of Stripe, people, you know, Stripe's in the FinTech ecosystem in an interesting way where ideally the end user doesn't even know it's Stripe, right? You know, people build platforms on Stripe. Stripe has this open, you know, API, you know, anyone can use it, anyone can implement it, very low barrier to entry. And and that's not what we're gonna just throw into the face of a hardware designer that's never done software before. And they just live in their CAD GUI all day. But it's something where all those hardware design tools, they have the same foundation, editing geometry, talking to geometry, communicating geometry into version control, into analysis, into, design instructions, manufacturing instructions. There's a whole ecosystem interconnectivity underneath every hardware design tool. And it's something that almost everyone that's done something to date, you know, all the incumbents, Autodesk, Siemens, um, PTC, they have their own very proprietary software stack that enables what is for the end user, a GUI on their screen where they're designing, you know, hardware. Um, for us, we want anyone to be able to design a CAD GUI, anyone to design automation, anyone to build a tool, just like Stripe, right, enables where you can have one part of that ecosystem talking to another in a semi or an automated, a semi-automated or a completely manual way, right, where you build a workflow that someone's clicking through. But the barrier to entry to developing that whole stack, just like in fintech, you know, you're replicating the back end for a bank when you use Stripe. Then a payments processor, like a credit card company, when you use Stripe, like that ecosystem is massive. That ecosystem is regulated. That ecosystem is super error prone. So let's bundle all of that up for the hardware world. Everything you'd want underneath the button, what's happening behind the scenes, you turn that into an easy to use API. And then the easy part is the GUI. The hard part's the back end. So we see a world where Every, you know, developer, every company, you know, even startups, and, and you see some of them cropping up now, some of our customers even, where they want to build a specific software tool for hardware design. They want to build the front end. They want to build the customer relationships. They want to build a couple unique features that they can really focus on and capitalize to their customer base. They don't want to build the back end of how to talk to a hardware file. They don't want to build, you know, the roots of the automation and the interconnectivity there. They just want to call an API. And that's something that is our ideal cohort is the people developing tools for hardware design and opening that ecosystem up, just like FinTech did with Stripe, you know, and Stripe did with FinTech. And where anyone can develop an automated solution, anyone can make a GUI, anyone can make a workflow. And that ecosystem and the size of that is, is, is massive because of the labor savings. Yeah, yeah. That's probably beyond the scope of what someone's most grandmas could understand. But I think that for a technically inclined, you know, engineering savvy audience that is pretty intuitive. And there's an interesting thread there about productizing like internal tooling and like turning a cost center into a revenue stream, like, you know, like Amazon famously did with AWS, but sadly we're pushing up on time. We'll have to save it for round two. I have two more rapid fire, rocket fire questions. They in, in, in past episodes, I haven't done such a good job of keeping them rapid fire, but Got to ask him nonetheless, what is your hottest take on the future of space flight, space exploration, or just the industry in general? Oh, hottest take. Um, my main person. Or to yeah, borrow, wait, to borrow, to borrow a term from your, your current industry, uh, most contrarian view. Most contrarian. Um, I'll view it as hottest take, uh, contrarian. I'll, I'll hold off on that one. And, um, but the, the hottest take I'd say is, is we're still 
going to see the full damage of the SPAC market and what that did specifically with regards to the space industry, right? I'd say is space and national security, right? As we see the damage in the venture ecosystem, you see investors retracting to consumer, retracting to dating apps, then holding off on deploying capital. This is the wrong year for the U.S. to take the foot the, to take the foot off the gas for the national security innovation community, right? Like this country is driven by capitalism. It's driven by private investor capital deployments. It's driven by you know a government that um, needs to encourage spend in national security innovation, right? We don't have the direct control that our our competition and national you know worldwide competition has the you know, the direct control of their um, business base, right? We don't have that. We have to encourage it through capitalism. And that's something that the um, kind of the conjunction this year of venture capital recklessness, the extreme example of that in space SPACs, you know, amongst other areas, then of that recklessness and kind of the general hesitation on deploying into national security that has been the growing foundation of Silicon Valley for the last couple of decades, and uh, leaves us in the uh, worst spot for encouraging national security entrance into, you know, kind of the defense or, or the void left by the defense primes as they've stagnated in many ways. And, and uh, it's just the wrong year, the wrong decade for that to happen. And we have yet to feel the full damage, I'd say, on a market side, on a space investing side and on a national security side of what's been happening for the last couple of years. Yeah, I've posed that question or something similar to it to a few past guests and just in conversations for, you know, our reporting uh, for payload and most folks will dance around it in some way. Just the question of whether SPAC performance and that phenomenon will have a, a chilling effect on future financing activity. And I'm glad that you answered on the record and, you know, gave a very forward and direct response to it. And, and and to bring bring some more optimism to it, I don't want to sound too dark, you know, with it is that I think, you know, on one side, it will highlight specifically for the space industry, how difficult it is to build a good company, you know, and turn capital into long term returns. And the VC world will always be good at generating returns from not only good companies, but bad companies, right? That is their role is to generate those returns and exit before, you know, that price or that bubble collapses. Right. That's been their model. And that's why it's venture. You know, it's very gamified. Um, it's very hyped up. It's very uh, pump and dump in various ways, too. And it'll highlight what's happened in the space industry across the board of that across the board in majority of companies. There's there's some still strong highlights that I'm uh, you know strong believers in, but it will create a significant pause and drive further that consumer focus. And which is um, I, I wish more people would talk about. Um, on the optimism side, it's, you know, part of our goal as a fund is to show that you can make returns and you can build good companies. You have to be patient. You have to be diligent. And it takes time and the right talent. But you're not going to do it wildly deploying into every company that, you know, shows you a pitch deck. And you're going to go heads down and it's going to take founders that are patient. Uh, and one of the biggest maybe detriments of the last 18 months is that there's a whole generation of companies. Every company started in the last 24 months have been there's are, are full of founders you know fundraisers that have no experience raising in a bad market they have no experience raising off of what is an actual plan you know i've had people i've asked questions to like what is your uh monetization plan this is maybe 12 months ago what's your monetization plan and they're like oh we're going to figure that out in a couple rounds and i'm like well what do you think it is and they're like why, why would we need that why do we need a monetization plan and it's terrifying, but those those companies and those founders and the why, the reason I get the most disappointed for what's happened within uh, kind of the influence and mentorship of the most recent generation of founders, then is a lot of those companies will fail and they could have been good companies and good founders if they had investors that encouraged good behavior rather than bad behavior. And, and you see memos and notes going out now to founders or Twitter threads, then saying it's time to hunker down you know, it's time to tighten the belt. You know, it's going to be a winter. Sequoia. Sequoia decks. And yeah. there's no reason why those funds, those incubators, shouldn't have been telling investor or founders that 18 months ago. If they were investing in founders that had the patience and the diligence to balance what to do in a good market versus a bad market, then, or telling them to start saving on cash 12 months ago, 
instead of wildly spending it, these companies would be in good positions today, but they're not because of the, the investors and they really are the ones to blame for enabling that bad, bad behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned mentorship and that's the last question that I had for you, you know, payloads, readership, last we checked, we had around 10% or so were students. And I think there's returning to an earlier point in the conversation, I just took some notes. I think there's something interesting to be said about your journey and your path and that it was a non-linear one. You know, it was not all predetermined and you allowed for serendipity. You allowed for like, you know, the, the chance encounter meeting, meeting Tim and that sort of thing that led to everything. And, and then, you know, deepening ties with, with Jenna. Uh, so on that note, what, what's one piece of advice you would share with those who are looking to break into the commercial space industry? Uh, the one piece of advice I'd give, and, and it took me a while to simmer on this. I think it was originally like a Sam Altman tweet then of, of Y Combinator days, then was on finding a niche that only you are good at. You know, take take two or three areas that you're passionate about, you're good at, you know, that you'll put an infinite amount of energy into, then, um, and figure out where they overlap, right? And find a very unique spot. Because anyone, you know, maybe not anyone, but, you know, it's, it's easy to have a good resume, right? You know, flushed out, bunch of recognitions, and, but, you know, anyone can get a 4.0 and show that. You don't stand out for getting a 4.0. You know, you don't stand out for having a bunch of AP classes, right? You stand out for having something unique that truly only you can do. And that is hard to find. I don't, I don't mean to like trivialize it or sound like it's trivial. It's taken me, I, I still don't know where exactly my intersection is. I'm still exploring that day to day. And, um, but at least in the relativity example, maybe even, you know, tying that to some of my UXC experience and it stretches into kitty cat and some of our investment work too. You know, I'm one of those lazy engineers. I'm rebellious and lazy you know, in a way where I don't like doing the same thing twice. That's where the automation comes from, building simulation tools at USC, right? You know, simplifying that process down so it's not always dealing with these old archaic tools where there's a bunch of manual tweaking to get the right data out, just build the right tool, right? Relativity was building the right tool as well. I was tired of making things by hand. I was tired of waiting for production. I was tired of having to see manufacturing engineers being hired for these one-off processes, right? It's very inertia prone or very inertiaful to um, to do something like that. And I wanted something that was easier, quicker. And, and that's the lazy side of me. Um, so you combine the laziness of kind of what ended up being engineering automation. You know, most of the best engineers in the world are the laziest because they end up doing things very efficiently. And um, combine that laziness with the rebellion and not wanting to work for anyone else, not wanting, you know, a, a boss kind of setting my own goals and uh, working full force for those. And um, I had a knack to, especially, you know, beginning of my career working on the rocket propulsion side, right? Rocket design. So combine those together of a rocket designer that, you know, is rebellious and wanting to start their own company, do their own thing, and being very lazy at the same time, you get relativity as the blend of those, right? That was something that truly, for my background, was a unique strength. Kitty cat on the tools and infrastructure and automation underneath the design side. And in USC with the simulation tools, we built automated machines within the lab as well that let us advance the projects um, with the amount of you know labor and, and resources we had as a lab. And um, there's a similar trend there. And I use that example as far as finding those couple areas, whether you're super passionate, super talented, uh, you know, wanting to put energy behind them and trying to find that unique area where you're the one person in the world that has that combination of skill sets. And if you find that and then figure out, you know, and again, non-trivial to get that recognized, whether through investment, through recognition, whether a project that you can do as a one-off that people want to buy because you're the only person in the world that can work on that combination of skill sets and passions, that's when you get that kind of life-changing inflection point. Yeah. Well, if this can influence one student out there who's listening, hopefully much more than we've done our jobs. Jordan, thanks so much for coming on the show. This has been great. Thank you, Ryan. All right. That's going to do it for Pathfinder 0010. That's right. We have made it to the third trailing zero. I don't know if I got that right. That was a long episode, so I'll keep this outro short. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Jordan for coming on the show. 
If you like what you heard, leave us a five-star rating wherever you're listening to this. And don't ever hesitate to reach out to me at ryan at paleospace.com with feedback, constructive criticism, or now pictures of cats. I'm Ryan Duffy signing off and I'll see you back here next week.